Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the October 2024 LF Decentralized Trust Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. Boy, that just gets more complex every month. We've got an exciting agenda, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Please note the name change from the Hyperledger Foundation to the LF Decentralized Trust, and we'll discuss this further on the next slide. Okay. Hyperledger is now part of the LF Decentralized Trust. The, the video that's referenced on this slide discusses this change, but in the interest of time, we're just going to provide the link and you guys can take a look at this video at your leisure and it'll explain the change. But very quickly, just the highlight. LF Decentralized Trust is the new umbrella body for blockchain uh, or Hyperledger, decentralized cryptography, identity, and more. Also, as part of this trust, Hedera Hashgraph announced, or excuse me, Hashgraph announced that it's transferring its code base to LF Decentralized Trust. So this is going to include the Hashgraph consensus mechanism. So as blockchain becomes more mature, adjacent technologies are in greater and greater demand, including zero knowledge proofs for privacy, other cryptography, and one of my key points, interoperability, identity, and uh, LF decentralized trust will serve as, and I'm going to emphasize this, a neutral home, neutral home for open development of a broad range of ledger, identity, security, interoperability, scale, implementation, and other technologies. So emphasis on interoperability, being technology agnostic, I think this is all fantastic, and we'll hopefully see more of it. Okay, as always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and is under the umbrella of the LF Decentralized Trust. So we ask that everyone ab abide by the antitrust policy and code of conduct. The antitrust policy is being shown and it states that we avoid discussions of company specific pricing products and projects. We don't make negative remarks about other companies or products. And the code of conduct means that we treat each other with respect never discriminate, communicate constructively. We solely, fully support LF decentralized trust policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. Okay, um, everyone's welcome uh, to be a part of this community. Um, Hyperledger, there's still gonna be some interspersings of Hyperledger in some of these slides, so we'll update those as we get a chance. Everyone's welcome. If you wanna lurk, lurk, this is how I, I joined some meetings, so uh, just feel free to, to listen and share your ideas as you're comfortable. Okay, part of the change to LF Decentralized Trust includes new members such as Hedera, as I mentioned. There's also Bank, Banco Central de Brazil, Polygon, and Pat, Pat Consulting, and then a bunch of these other premier members. Okay. Uh, just some tips to get comfortable. I'm not going to spend uh, any time on this, but lurk. Uh, don't wait for an invitation. Uh, do what feels good. Oh my God, I feel like I'm a 70s hippies. Okay, uh, here's our agenda for today. We've covered the introduction. Next, we'll go into. We've already gone into some community information. James will give us an update on blockchain. Um, then we'll continue with the topics that we broached last month. AI and blockchain and real estate. Uh, I think we have uh, some real interesting speakers. We have Teresa Grobrecker, uh, a loan officer, real estate broker, and tech entrepreneur, excuse me, I always mispronounce that, who will discuss her experience with AI and blockchain as a real estate professional. We also have the CEO of Formfree, who will be speaking about Web5 and consumer data as it relates to underwriting and blockchain and Web5 marketing. Um, and that's Brett Chandler. So welcome, Brett. We definitely appreciate you joining us. We always cover this slide in each meeting, and this is just to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey. We just may be at different points along that path. So this group is meant to help everyone on their blockchain journey demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology and define potential implementation paths. So just some community information. I always burn this really quickly since it, it, it's just a, as a PSA. This slide provides the different links to different resources for the Linux Foundation, uh, LF Decentralized Trust, 
The second one from the bottom is the link to our subgroup wiki. So take a look at that and James will talk about that uh, in a bit of detail as well. Um, how to access this information, you'll need an LFID. Just go through this slide. I'm not going to spend any time on it. And then if you're so inclined, I highly recommend getting a Hyperledger Fabric certification. Um, I, I think this underscores that this is a technology you're committed to and you've shown a certain amount of uh, expertise. Uh, blockchain Training, this is free. I always mention that this is how I got started in blockchain and I highly, highly recommend it. And as always, I love the word free. And that brings us to the status of blockchain in the mortgage industry. So James, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Marvin. Great opening. Um, you know, as we talk about the name change over to LF Decentralized Trust, uh, we did talk about that, I believe, in last month's presentation as well. And we've got some articles and links available on our wiki site. So definitely do take a look at those. But kind of jumping into the research that we've done this last month. So this first article from Blockchain Magazine kind of touches on that concept of crypto mortgages. Um, what are they? Why are people using them? Focuses a lot on uh, avoiding taxation as selling crypto is going to trigger capital gains taxes. So by using it as collateral, homeowners can avoid taxes while still leveraging their assets. Borrowers get to retain the ownership and they can benefit from any appreciation in the value of their assets while the mortgage is in place. And also talks about crypto uh, backed mortgages, how it offers individuals without strong credit scores access to home loans based on their digital assets. The article then continues to go into how blockchain is enabling crypto backed mortgages, everything from smart contracts that are automating loan disbursements, monitoring collateral value and enforcing repayment terms. DeFi platforms that are out there that can create a decentralized marketplace where individuals pledge their cryptocurrency as collateral and receive the loans in return. And then some DeFi platforms offer crypto mortgage through liquidity pools where lenders can earn interest by locking up funds and smart contracts. This allows homeowners to choose the terms, the rates and collateral levels that meet their needs. The article discusses the benefits of these mortgages. Um, we've discussed them before in the past, including the diversity of investments, streamlining the process, and providing uh, more transparency and security. But it also addresses the challenges crypto mortgages pre present from the volatility of these markets, regulatory uncertainty, and you know, currently there's still limited adoption and liquidity risks that are being addressed. So it, it does cover some real world examples, including Milo, which provides a variety of products and figure who closes on the HELOC spaces. We've had articles that we've touched on for both Milo and figure in the past as well. Um, take a look at the, the wiki site if you're interested in learning more about this particular article or about Milo or figure, you're gonna find information on both of them there. Marvin, moving on to the next slide. All right. So in our July podcast, we talked about Project Guardian and the pilot program with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So as a general reminder, Project Guardian is a joint effort between policymakers and the financial sector aimed at improving liquidity in financial markets through real world asset tokenizations. Australia's ANC Bank is the newest player in the arena. The bank is focused on enhancing the mobility of its Australian dollar-backed stablecoin across blockchains. And to achieve this, ANC will leverage Chainlink's Cross-Chain Interoperability Protocol, or CCIP, which allows real-world assets to move between blockchains. ANC and Chainlink Labs recently connected blockchains for the international transfer and settlement of tokenized assets, most notably between Avalanche and Ethereum. And the International Monetary Fund, along with governments from the United Kingdom, Japan, 
Singapore, Switzerland, and France comprise the policymakers for Project Guardian. So again, Project Guardian looks like it's really starting to take off and get some legs behind it in the international market. Take a look at this article if you'd like to learn some additional information. Marvin, on to our next article. All right, this was brought to us by Lehigh Valley Business. So this next article discusses the benefits of how a digital ledger for property is able to streamline and enhance and accelerate the ownership verification process. For investors, developers, or real estate investment trusts, blockchain offers alternative financial models, creates transparency for all parties, including lenders and borrowers. Secondary markets with mortgages or mortgage-backed securities could be among the first to integrate blockchains into new recording practices. LVB states initial adopters of blockchain could be large financial institutions and companies already incorporating cutting-edge technologies into their practices. The combination of AI, the Internet of Things, the metaverse, and blockchain create a junction of technology that makes it extremely feasible. For example, numerous property records have already been migrated to searchable electronic formats over the past 10 to 15 years, many using the same technology. Using blockchain to maintain the history would create a secure record of ownership of transfers and other events, making future sale or transfers more streamlined. The article also discusses crypto mortgages, emphasizes one of our favorite reminders that blockchain is separate from crypto, and outlines some of the pros and cons to this approach. Speculating its more conventional use as a form of mortgage payments in the near term. So very interesting article, highly recommend taking a look. Um, you know, I, I definitely, as I read through it, when they started talking about using blockchain for mortgage payment for um, the tracking of reporting with investors, I definitely see a real world marketplace for that. Uh, Marvin, moving on to the next slide. All right, so our last article is focused on decentralized identity. So back in March, as well as last month, we talked about self-sovereign and digital identity concepts, particularly in how blockchain can assist in preventing identity, identity theft. So this guide is actually a 60 page white paper. It has valuable source of information discussing these concepts in much further detail than what I'm gonna go into. While it is industry agnostic, it covers what are decentralized identities, the key benefits of these solutions and why they're important for organizations, individuals, as well as developers. It cracks open the difference between decentralized identities and self-sovereign self identities and the management approaches for this type of information as well as verification. The company that produced the white paper, Doc, is a verifiable credentials company that provides Doc certs that enables organizations to issue, manage, and verify fraud-proof credentials efficiently and effectively. And while many of the examples focus on the Docs platform, the information provided is knowledge for general application um, in any side, uh, any type of decentralized or self-sovereign identity platform. So uh, a great read, very detailed. As I mentioned, I think it was a little bit over 60 page white paper. Um, so do take the opportunity to, to take a look at that if you get a chance. Moving on to the next slide, Marvin. So along with the recent name change to LF Decentralized Trust, our wiki has also been updated reflecting that change. We've also tightened up a little bit of the menu options over on the far left. Um, you'll find the articles that we talked about today along with the uh, last couple months available on the far right side. Uh, Alma's actually dropping the link in down at the bottom for us right now. So if you have the opportunity, Click on that and make it a favorite. Over on the left side too, in our subgroup menu, you're gonna find links to all of our past pre 
presentations going back to 2021, as well as all of the articles that we've talked about. Um, at the beginning of the call, Marvin mentioned the LFID in the upper right. If you sign up for the LFID, it's free. You'll get notifications every month when we're making updates to the wiki, along with easy access to the, the posting and the calendar invites that come out. Marvin, take us on to the next slide. You know, this is just a general reminder as well. We do have out there and available, there's a YouTube channel for Decentralized Trust. All of these uh, episodes that we record do get posted to there. We also create a YouTube playlist that is specific to just our presentations. Um, there's a Discord channel that's available, so feel free to communicate with the the blockchain community in Discord, as well as our LinkedIn page, where we do do a lot of the marketing and posting for these presentations as well. So Alma, Alma is dropping those links into the, the bottom as well. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll find all of those links available in the information content just below this presentation. Marvin, I think that's it for me. I'm going to pass it back over to you for introductions. Thanks, James. That's always uh, some really interesting information and always interested in finding out what's going on in the mortgage industry. So um, thank you for that. And, and now uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Teresa Grobrecker. She is a loan officer, a real estate broker uh, whose expertise and industry experience includes collaboration with NAR, the National Association of Realtors. Um, she's also collaborated with the Federal Housing Finance, Finance Agency, FUFA, and the United States Federal Reserve. So, Teresa, welcome, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everybody. Good morning and good afternoon. Um, is it okay if I start sharing my screen, please? Yes, I've just Awesome, sure. awesome, awesome. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so today we're going to be discussing the evolution of consortia. We um, have had quite a journey and a lot of brain damage um, in building out blockchain and being a first mover in the space. So we'd love to share all this with you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Marvin. Thank you for having me here today. So I started on Wall Street, then started the first um, online real estate brokerage in San Francisco. I developed a medical condition that kept me at home for a little while. It's called pregnancy and having children. So I started this as a hobby. I had a kid on each hip and was just starting this real estate brokerage, just thinking, okay, this will be a way to connect with humans, albeit remotely. So that was a long time ago, and it's turned into this journey. Um, I was acquired by a global investment bank, unsolicited, and then worked for them with them as an equity partner for a few years, took my real estate company back. Along this way, I took every piece of property in the United States, created a truly global identifier. Because <clears throat> a lot of our identifiers right now work only stateside, even though we call them global, meaning they work for all the different kinds of GIS and county recorders and mortgage and real estate. This one truly takes in and encompasses a global spoke, uh, focus, of property. We um, we started out using one kind of blockchain and we've created five iterations of this platform. Um, so that is my experience and background. Um, our mission was just to get ahead of global players such as Russia and China. Um, it was really a do good kind of mission and to help the United States. So we kind of are known as pioneering this space and I've become a global speaker in this regard. Um, it's think of it as a backbone. From there, you can put all kinds of information on to the blockchain to be able to store data and access data. Um, we first started with Ethereum. We were waiting and waiting for layer twos to come out. This was back in 2017, 2018. Um, and I should note, this is my second blockchain project, the first one. I worked on was 2013, and it was to set up a system to fractionalize and decentralize um, derivative products. We started in the real estate space, and that company has since gone out to create blockchain derivatives for that, that encompass all industries. So for this one, we were waiting for a layer two. That, of course, 
had years to further bake. So we decided to just go ahead with Ethereum. We were fine. We were sitting at about two cents per transaction. And then China, there was some kind of um, ICO that launched in China. And that spiked our per transaction cost to about 70 cents. I thought, okay, I don't want to base my uh, business, my P&Ls off of something that's appreciating in value. So that just, it didn't, the math on that didn't work. I'm a very much math person. So we also thought there are data risks. It's very nascent. Um, a lot of this is public ledger. How much of our PII, um, we have strict rules in California. We have GDPR to consider in Europe. So we thought, okay, <coughs> excuse me. We got to find a different solution. Um, also, let's go back in time in even like a year or two ago, and we're still waiting for a clarification from the SEC. So there was this really fun night at the dinner table where um, I'm sitting there with my husband. This is back in 2017. And Obama had just uh, created some different regulations. He's on Wall Street, still is. He's amazing, touch wood. Um, and He's, I, I said, should we launch a crypto? I asked, should we launch a crypto? I said, we might have to move to Singapore based on rules. He said, well, because of what Obama just passed, Mother Merrill, Merrill Lynch, is closing, Bank of America is closing all your uh, all Asia activities, which was a huge hit to a lot of the financial advisors here on the West Coast. So I said, oh, well, I guess we're not moving to Singapore then. And we cheers, we were drinking cab and we cheers and we said, okay, no crypto. So that's why we stayed private we we switched over to a private ledger just seemed like the right place to go because the information is private it's permission based only everything we know here on this call um so we thought this is the way to go so our most recent iteration <coughs> excuse me um i've been running a lot lately and it's just kicking out all kinds of chest stuff sorry so we are now looking at potentially public ledger integration. And again, this goes to the SEC. So whatever the SEC deems is potentially legal versus not legal, because I have advised the SEC, Federal Reserve, um, and we're very cognizant of what is going on politically with crypto, FedNow, all kinds of things. So we're exploring the viability of public ledger. I personally think, and I was just on the phone with someone I think it was Brent. Brent, you and I were talking about this yesterday, prepping for the call, because uh, we think, I think that Bitcoin is potentially here to stay. I think you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube on that one. So potentially a layer two on Bitcoin or a layer two on Ethereum are probably the safest ways to go if you're going to go on to a public ledger. And really, this probably has the most viability overseas because People turn to crypto overseas if there's instability in their currencies, um, not to say that we don't, right? Um, in politics right now, we're, we're hearing a lot of things with our, um, with our national debt, et cetera. So these are all the considerations that we have. Um, we're obviously balancing in this way, cryptography, data production. Um, with what we're building next, we are going to use, um, well, I think I'm gonna get to that, but we're, we're just very, we're very aware of this. Let me see if I can get this play. Okay, so let me pause this. This is an example of what we built. And perhaps if anyone on this call has ever stalked me on online, you might've seen this. And I'm happy to um, make available all this information. We have training that we'll share with the group and we'll even up open up the base code for what you're seeing here. So this is to mint a property NFT. I'm saying that my name is Teresa Grobecker. Um, how is this piece of property held? And then we give it the address. And then we're going to upload a photo of the property. We're going to upload some kind of documentation that would show that I am the owner of this property. So my settlement statement um, for the old schoolers on this call, that used to be the HUD. Um, I am going to yeah, input my credit card information. And then here you can see the blockchain data. <clears throat> So that's an example of what we can make available to the group. Um, going forward, we're working on some things about housing data about the inside of the house. Uh, this is something that Fannie and Freddie have very, been very keen on for a lot of years. Companies like CoreLogic, um, ICE, name your data company, right? They Everyone wants to get inside the four walls. 
So um, IPFS is a very old technology. It's kind of a key to go access the data. And then that data, I believe, could be traded and connected with a public ledger. If you wanted to buy, sell the data out here, the key would direct you to where that data is stored. So of course, in the system, we have to have data storage, access, indexing, and then a connection out to public. Um, I'm flying through this because I know everyone on this call is super brilliant. So um, if you have more questions, you can always reach out. Um, so the road ahead, uh, we still very much want to be involved in the industry and to be deployed in any way that we think is possible. Um, I know that consortium was very early and very, um, we, we, we've caught a lot of arrows in the back. We've learned a lot of things, broken our brains open on this. So uh, we know that everyone is kind of uh, getting comfortable with the idea of blockchain. So we're here as a resource. So if any of these topics, migration, um, public ledger, using our code is interesting, you're always welcome to stalk me on LinkedIn. You can scan this QR code right now and connect, send me a message and um, would love to keep the conversation going. And I'm going to stop talking here. Thanks for listening to my TED talk. And uh, uh, Marvin, I don't know if you want to open this up for questions, if we have time or if you want to jump in with Brent. So happy to do whatever is best for you. Uh, th thanks, Teresa. And, and thank you for that invitation for people to reach out. I think I know of at least one or two people that's interested in taking a look at your code. So I'll definitely connect after this. Uh, I would like to turn it over to Brent so that he can go through uh, his presentation. Brent, I, I know this is the first time we've met, so I, I apologize for not being able to uh, introduce myself or meet with you uh, earlier. But let me introduce you to uh, our group. So Brett Chandler is the CEO and founder of Freeform. His experience includes being the director of sales and business dev at Pfizer. <clears throat> His experience also includes Thompson Reuters, Merrill Lynch, and some time as a U.S. Marine. So welcome, Brett. Oh, you're on the there you go. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. No. Um, <clears throat> You know, with age, you get you get the 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 resume the resume grows, and then the, the standouts are interesting to hear. But uh, yeah, like thank you for having me. Uh, it's very nice to meet you in this group, and I'm excited to kind of share a little bit about you know what we're seeing. Um, the um, the company is form free. I founded it 17 years ago, and with with a simple concept um, that. Uh, the common denominator in every loan was literally you. And um, if we could understand you, the human, at a risk level, um, then we could effectively lend money. And my background, uh, you know, the Mother Merrill, I heard Mother Merrill out there, you know, Merrill birthed me into the finance arena um, back in the 90s. And, um, that was post uh, Marine Corps, six years in the Marine Corps, uh, second Marine Air Wing, Tactical Air Command, Control Air Support, Air Defense Logistics. That's a mouthful. Um, we love our acronyms in the Marine Corps, so <laughs> I use them all the time at Form Free too. Um, but effectively, you know, this 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 background led me to Wall Street and. Um, from Merrill to hedge fund, to trading, to building technology. And that's ultimately where I landed. I have a background in mathematics and computer science. Uh, and yeah, the tech really, really suited my, uh, my, my interest, my passion. Um, everything from building the world's first online trade in 1996, we deployed that um, and quickly were acquired and watch the digitization of a manual brokerage process from being a Merrill broker to online trading. It was pretty cool to see the transformation and it went further. Uh, you mentioned figure, Mike Cagney and the work he's doing uh, is, is tremendous, provenance, et cetera. But back in the day, we were competitors in institutional portfolio management software. So building systems that could do high throughput, whether it be an exchange, whether it be a smart order routing engine or uh, an algorithmic black box trading system. You know, I participated in all of that. And it really, it really 
cultivated in in understanding that simple concept of where data resides, how to gain access to it, and then make it actionable for people. Um, and that's ultimately what I saw in the founding of Form Free was the lenders didn't really understand who I was. Uh, they they couldn't really read me, nor could they understand what my risk was. And I could provide them with digital information, <clears throat> but they weren't ready for it. So I set out to do that. And that ultimately um, became the world's first digital verification of asset information, which is now asset income and employment digitized direct from source with reps and warrants from Fannie and Freddie. So in other words, we've created a token for the consumer um, that's anchored on chain that could represent their financial identity. And that's what we set out to do. We've expanded on that. And what I'd like to do is take a moment there to breathe and uh, <laughs> so and and pull my screen up if I may. All right. Um, so I'm guessing there is a share feature here. Share screen, there we go. And I'm just gonna share this deck. Can you all see that? Yes. All right, cool. You know, one of the great things about technology is things like this, but also how how we uh, we learn how to use it. Um, so yeah, form free. And by the way, just so you know, um, form free or free form, 50% right down the middle, humans have this interesting kind of play of words where that, that particular form free um, gets split 50-50 from free form to form free, depending on who you talk to. Very fascinating. Um, I should do a study on that at some point. Um, but I'm trying to move this header thing. Do you guys see that on your screen or not? No, all right. No, no. So what is Passport? What do we, so Form Free founded uh, this 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 idea uh, called Passport, which is your financial identity. And it's a decentralized consumer facing um, application that effectively anonymizes your information, but allows you as a consumer to understand the richness of your data. It generates what we call a RICI, a residual income knowledge index. And this index is an alternative to credit. So what we've seen are the barriers that have prevented so many people from entering into home ownership, which we believe is the single largest mechanism for generating wealth in this country. And uh, I think we would all agree that uh, real estate and home ownership provide well beyond just the wealth, uh, the nucleus of the family and, and, and generational opportunities. So not being able to have access to that was a problem for me. And so we created this tool, which effectively would assess a person's ability to pay, provide a residual income uh, calculation against that, an index, which would correspond with a FICO and effectively show a risk metric of this consumer instantaneously on what they could afford and their capacity to pay and uh, with some historical background, meaning we look back a year to two years. So it's trended. So the problem in the industry was that, again, what we talked about was that there's there are barriers. There are barriers. In this country today, we see a barrier that is, is widening a wealth gap um, that has persisted for uh, close to 60 years. Uh, a wealth gap is expanding, which means um, the black household communities versus the white household communities, the, the, the amount of wealth has expanded. Now, we would expect that with 1968 Fair Housing Act, um, that discrimination and, and other forms of, uh, of exclusion would have been eliminated, but that didn't happen. And so I took a look into what was the root cause? Where, where, where is this and why is this happening? Is it a racial discrimination? Is it something unintentional? And what we found is that that credit data alone, just looking at a three digit score of a consumer, of a borrower was not enough to truly understand their capacity and ability to pay. However, it was enough to eliminate 
uh, over 86% of the African American households. So that became the the focus of what we uh, what we looked at, and we created Passport to solve that, and that was in part due to Dodd Frank introduction of the um, residual income in lieu of DTI and gross as an alternative to measuring risk. We found it to be superior to FICO in all cases on delinquency measurement, meaning the 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 Ricky index could be a higher a, 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 a broader wealth metric of understanding risk, and it was equal to or superior in proving uh, or identifying delinquency in the future. And so we have a corpus of data over 10 years that have, has proven that. So once again, um, this application is a decentralized, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we're currently working in the Web5 arena. Um, some of you may be familiar with TBD. TB, TB Lend is the, uh, was the original name of our, uh, of our node in the TBD Web5 uh, environment. It's since moved into the decentralized credential exchange. So we launched the decentralized credential exchange um, earlier this year in Berlin. Uh, that was pretty exciting. We were out there with, uh, with Flock CEO, with Google and uh, part of that announcement, we spoke about removing friction in the lending arena. And effectively, the decentralized credential exchange is exactly what it says, it's self-sovereign financial identity, which breaks down into all the components of identity in verified credentials that are held in your, in your DID. So um, how do we do that? Well, we're, we're pulling source data on behalf of permissioned uh, access from the consumer. We're harvesting that information, and then we're creating this high intent or this, this, this high value understanding of risk, presenting that back with the borrower. And then the borrower elects to work with a, con with a lender if they're ready to get a loan, and they enter into our exchange. So we also built a decentralized exchange to which lenders meet borrowers based on attributes, removing all bias, removing all PII until such time as the borrower elects to actually work with that lender. And it's one-to-one. -one. So no more robo calls, no more spams. This is a one-to-one -one relationship based on high intent, high value attributes of that consumer, completely decentralized without the bias. And you know, it's it's really answering a question of 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 we look at two thousand eight and we see a crisis based on the willful disregard of lenders to assess a borrower's ability to pay a loan. That was the root cause, according to the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission post mortem uh, in two thousand twelve. And you know, it dawned on me that they just couldn't. It wasn't almost that it was willful. It was just that the, the regulations opened up some windows and opportunities. And as humans, we are uh, we we will capitalize on that. And effectively, not understanding how much somebody could afford was really the big deal. Um, giving loans to people who couldn't afford it. Well, you can't do that uh, with a system like ours in place. Um, so you absolutely understand at a very high granular level. Um, artificial intelligence goes into over 48,000 financial institutions. We generate natural language processing, new libraries, new language, actually, completely, uh, on what the data is telling that us about the consumer, as well as providing those analytics on a deterministic accounting methodology with no bias. And that quality is done in a nanosecond and it's anchored on chain. Um, it gives the borrower a, uh, a deep understanding of what they can afford. Uh, it would have illustrate to a realtor what uh, a proof of funds for that borrower. So in other words, it could be just, it could be shared as a medallion uh, to that realtor as a proof of funds. And on the flip side, you could enter into the exchange and instantaneously find a lender that is ready to work with you. And what it does for the industry is effectively, it opens up 
the um, it really opens up the credit box without the risk. So, you know, we've got a lot of people standing by. We've got 115 million renters who get zero credit for that monthly payment, which on average today is larger than mortgage monthly payments. Believe that one. Um, so you've got a lot of folks that are able to enter the mortgage purchasing space. Um, and, and everybody wants to talk about rates and everybody wants to talk about uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, um, the housing, uh, you know, what, what, how many houses there are, I, I'm losing the word, but, you know, what I would tell you is that um, if we open up the credit box, we can certainly match people with the abundance of properties that do exist and that sit idle for a long time. Um, shortage of inventory. There we go. It came. Um, so yeah, uh, everybody wins in this scenario. Um, the decentralized nature of it is, is very exciting because it globalizes this opportunity. And as, as uh, Teresa shared, um, you know, Bitcoin's here to stay. There's no question that the, that the opportunity of crypto and currency uh, playing in, in lending is absolutely going to play a role. We need to be able to value those assets in some way, even as a hedge against your traditional income and so forth. So we're talking to, to several participants in that arena and marrying Ricky with your crypto assets as well. Uh, and lastly, I'll just share that, um, you know, this is part of, this is my journey. It's a mission for me. It's a passion. Um, giving is the highest form of living to serve others, uh, is, is what I'm all about. Um, formerly as a taker, I realized that was very, very much a, uh, a horrible way to live. And, um, you know, 16 years ago when I founded Form Free, I founded it on a premise of love. And I love what I do, but I also love extending an opportunity to another human being who might not have otherwise had that opportunity. So thanks for letting me share. I appreciate it. Uh, Brent, uh, thank you. That that was uh, an excellent uh, presentation and definitely appreciated your, your thoughts at, at the end there. Um, one of the things, it, there was a, a question from Rick. Uh, Rick Brandt wanted to know when this exchange was launched, and then there was a, a, a question that I had uh, about a potential use uh, of your, your technology. Uh, yeah, so the exchange, uh, just to answer that question first, um, the exchange was launched um, sometime in April, and we've had multiple iterations, much like Teresa shared, you know, like... I think I think it's funny. Like I think it's interesting. Like we we grew the company um, from its onset when we received that day one certainty that rep and warrant relief in 2016. We launched Rocket Mortgage and 3,500 lenders came aboard our our B2B model and um, and we've served over five trillion in in loan verifications B2B. When we when we jumped into B2C 22 months ago. Um, we thought, oh yeah, of course. I mean, lenders were only going to take it so far. So we said, we've got to finish the mission. We've got to get this to the consumers. And by the way, who, somebody said they like free. It's free. It's free to the consumer, man. We want to give it to everybody. Please give it, give it away. Uh, find us at formfree.com, passport.formfree.com. But yeah, the exchange is filled right now with just under 40, around 40 lenders. Some bigs are in there as well, and the news is is growing like a wildfire. Um, and we expect about a hundred lenders in in the exchange by year end, and we're we're tracking in that general area. Um, it's really exciting to see the 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 nature of instantaneous relationships. So, borrower comes in, it's instant match. We had one happen at at two o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, whoever's doing, you know, whatever, people do loans at weird times. I mean, it's, <laughs> we accommodate all, all times, all people, all, 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 all generations. So um, yeah, we're wide open. We're, we're excited. We're welcoming lenders to come in. I do believe that we'll see a consolidation in the lender space by virtue of some, some people really beginning to understand how to create a buy box and identify these, these high value borrowers. 
Um, we are working with some very large um, consumer facing applications that are bringing us a plethora of, of high interest, high intent borrowers. So that's, we're running, we're running full steam right now. And I, if I could just share one fabulous story, um, this tells the whole thing. And this is, this is what it's all about. Um, we had a, 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 a medallion, we call them medallions as they enter our exchange. So a consumer came in, a borrower came in and the, this, the, uh, the attributes were such that she, uh, she had a 141 Ricky, a credit score of 560, a borrowing power of 700,000 and was asking for a $300,000 loan. Okay. And then if you, if you just take those four elements and we verified, we verified identity, we verified bank account, we verify all the other things. Uh, a 560 FICO got this many looks from lenders in our exchange, zero. A 141 Ricky, just to give you a sense of what Ricky is, 80 is the low end of the spectrum, 150 is the high end. And it's a simple measurement of cash flow. And it's trended over a year. So we harvest a year's worth of data and trend that score. So we actually look at large movements of information and data coming, transactions coming in and out, income, et cetera. And we look at all forms of, of income. Anyway, needless to say, 141 was the highest Ricky we've ever seen. I mean, perfection is, I mean, 150, and that's probably double your income um, that you're... It, you have no expenses. I, I don't even know how you get a 150. <laughs> and just to put things in perspective, I'm like an 80. And the the reality is I have an 800 FICO and I'm telling on myself, you can, uh, you know, look, I run a company. Um, uh, the, my cash flow is, is what it is, but the, uh, the fact that I got a loan and she did not set me on fire. So I literally, took that lead, took that medallion and went to work and got, and we will be telling a story about this veteran. She's a veteran as well. And for whatever reason, the FICO score wasn't there, but this is a stellar candidate for a loan. And our system proved that this person deserved a loan, could afford the loan, needed to get into the loan, and and the prevention of that three num three digit score was was it's one vector in the component of the analytics of risk. Sure, it's it's important. We don't want to just completely ignore it. We don't. <laughs> we 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 understand it, but we cannot just close people out. So the story will resonate around uh, this industry, and we'll sh we'll begin to see change. As far as uh, the other question, um, which was. Uh, no, I, I had a follow-up question uh, to the, the question that Rick posed. Oh, Rick, did Brent answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's, okay. that's great, Brent. We don't have to worry about that third question. That was just about something you said previously, okay. but yeah. Okay, cool. Um, my, my question, Brent, is last month, we had a gentleman who demonstrated uh, a real estate application. And what he was looking for was essentially what you described, a, a medallion or the way that he described it was a tokenized pre-approval letter. So he built an application and he's released it in the Pacific Northwest. It's called Migrate. It, it's an application for realtors and people looking for homes to go on there to match so that, um, someone that's buying or interested in taking a look at real estate would get a quote unquote uh, token or, or, or a pre-approval letter and be able to take a look at houses and realtors can see that, hey, this person is qualified for this house that I'm selling. They meet the income requirements and then they can match up. So I, I think the solution that you're talking about would fit his needs. I mean, I, ideally, I, I'd love to get together with you after this call and, and introduce you yeah, to him, I, I, I think he's looking for it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. And then my follow-up question is, 
How familiar are you with home lending, pal? Because uh, they, they seem to me, and, and James, uh, you and I have, have met the guys from Home Lending Pal. They're looking for, or they're trying to solve a, a similar problem. They they have a, a real interesting approach to the marketplace. They're trying to get people into houses. They're trying to level the 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 home lending uh, ecosystem as well. Uh, I think they'd be uh, a real interesting partner for you. Okay. No, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, we're open. You know, we're speaking with anybody and everybody that's interested. And again, I would actually be happy to, um, you know, to introduce anyone on this call or mm -hmm. anyone that's interested into the TBD environment, the decentralized web nodes are easy to build, the open pro protocols, um, Daniel Buckner and and that team under Jack Dorsey are uh, really, you know, creating an ecosystem that I think is gonna is gonna make some some headway in decentralization. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I'm not sure if there's anyone else on the call that has any questions. Uh, Brent, I'm really intrigued by your technology, and yeah, uh, definitely would like to catch up with you after this call. Set awesome. up time and yeah, uh, I think there's some potential collaborations there. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm trying to kill this this share thing. Sorry, and I I do apologize for taking so much time. Um, looks like there's a lot of other people that want to talk as well. But thank you for your time. Yeah, it's very interesting because I I keep hearing your name. I thought you were an electronic document provider. <laughs> electronic documents. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you know Garth Graham? Yeah, of course. You know Garth? Garth mentioned you to me, me to you, you to me. He told me about you back this spring. And I said, yeah, I'm not really interested in electronic documents, dude. So <laughs> get out of here. No, he think he speaks very highly of you. And Marvin, were you talking about the guy that presented with me last month? Yes. Yeah. Think I'd be very interested to hear what Teresa thinks of what he's building with her background in real estate. That'd be really interesting. So you might want to share it with her too. That'd be. Oh, a absolutely. Yeah. Um, Teresa, I I think I did send you the link earlier to last month's presentation. I'll I'll send it to the both of you uh, as well. Um, it, I think there's a, a potential connection there. He's interesting. I'm on that call too. You can ignore my part. I'm just rambling about crap. <laughs> Okay, so I, I know we're getting at the top of the hour. I haven't had a chance to take a look at the chats. Um, are there any other questions uh, from the, the rest of the audience? Oh, yeah, thank just, you for some uh, kind, kind comments. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I think those are all of our questions. Uh, I know we're getting to the top of the hour, so if there aren't any other questions, um, I'm just going to go ahead. Whoa, did I end? Okay, uh, apologize. Uh, I, I think I just pressed the wrong button. I'm just going to go ahead and say thank you to everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, on this call. Teresa, Brent, uh, excellent presentations. I'll reach out to you guys at, after this. I'm sure there are other people that are going to want to reach out to you. Um, we uh, This meeting has been recorded, will be posted on our wiki and YouTube. We've been averaging some 300 plus downloads. So I, I think this one will definitely uh, meet that and, and exceed it as well. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to give you six minutes back to your day. Great show. Teresa, Brent, thank you for presenting today. Thank that you. was great. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Teresa, for the great to see you. The invite. Yeah, and you too. Okay. Talk soon. Bye.